let's get a warm welcome to Ronnie Tobler. He is the CEO of Kenzen Studios and his subject of today is Economics of Virtual Reality Arcades. Ronnie Tobler. Thank you. You're ready. <laughs> Slides. Good morning. Wild nights are coming up. Um, very happy to be here. I'm CEO of Kenzan Studios and I'm going to talk about the economics of virtual reality arcades. Normally we do talk about the creativity aspects of what we do, not the money. But as this is an investment forum and there is a big money focus, I will share my experiences I gained during the last year in designing virtual reality arcades. Good. So while we're waiting for the slides, a few words about me. I founded my first company 20 years ago. It's that fancy logo that you see up there, Qcom. It was, the design there was a burner 20 years ago, believe me. It's now quite outdated. Um, we built PCs at a very young age, sold them, did support, grew the company, and three years after we sold them um, to a bigger company. Um, I then moved to Microsoft. I spent a fabulous time there, 15 years. Did the move from complete technical to leadership and led at the end the uh, enterprise sales team uh, in Switzerland. Now, on the right hand side, you see all my interests and hobbies. Um, basically, I'm an absolute technology and gadget freak. I uh, spent all my time in that and I spend a lot of time on YouTube. I'm one of the few YouTubers that actually speak Swiss German um, on the channel. I'm still the only one, and we talked 2017, that uh, speaks Swiss German and does weekly vlogging about what is happening on the market and what is happening in uh, business. Now, why am I telling you this? All these things that I experienced, I found is in this fabulous jewel con called uh, Kenzan Studios. We all we do all these things. Kenzan Studios originally is a content developer. We create our own IP and deliver it through books, through apps, through virtual reality games and through virtual reality films. I say that virtual reality because we don't do any two-dimensional stuff. Um, the company took a decision about 2012 to invest a lot of time into virtual reality because the storytelling aspect in virtual reality is completely different as if you frame the picture in a traditional movie. We are at the moment around about 42 people and almost all of them um, focus on content development in virtual reality. Um, about three weeks ago, you probably never heard of us, we announced this, Kenzan Arena. Kenzan Arena is our franchise brand for virtual reality arcades. Now, us being a content developer, why did we do that step? Basically, as a next generation storyteller, there is no facility currently to really tell the stories how we want to tell them. You have HTC Vive or high quality HMDs at home, um, not in a big number, which are confined single player experiences, it's not a social uh, thing. <laughs> And you have, uh, across the world, you have different virtual reality arcades. But um, we were lacking the multiplayer, the social aspect of it. That's why we started a few years ago to build the system ourselves, partnered up with a Chinese company that is uh, fabulous in motion tracking and added all the other things on top that we needed to complete um, the system. So we are talking over 200 square meters of free roaming space. We of course have wind, we of course have scent, and we have motion platforms that can basically emulate anything you want to create uh, in the games. And the first location we will actually open here in Zurich in uh, August. We probably announce in about two weeks where that will be. We haven't announced that uh, yet. What is special about um, this system is it should be a standard for content creation studios worldwide that they can develop content for, not only us developing content, 
and they know that it will run in a few hundred facilities worldwide without adapting it, because that's the challenge we have currently. A lot of people are interested in our content, but I have to adapt it to every location, because every location at the moment is different. Also special, we are not just about gaming. So the facilities we have are gaming facilities, mainly in the evening, are educational facilities. So we want to have schools coming in, just talked in the other break to uh, Stadt Zurich back there about uh, things they are developing, ideal scenarios, schools taking a time trip into the past together, things you can't do in real life. And also businesses, so be it um, architecture, be it that you want to show a boat, that you want to sell to a high net worth individual, um, or, or you want to train people, um, we will open up our facility for rent for businesses also. Good, enough for the introduction. Now the question is how do we make this work in Switzerland? And our idea was if we make it work in Switzerland, because Switzerland is fabulously expensive, it will work in almost every other market. Um, in Switzerland we are talking about $300 of square meter price for a business facility if you're located in a city. It can go up to 12,000 Swiss francs if you think you want to have the Bahnhofstrasse, but we're not going there. We have very high average salaries. That's a median salary is around $6,000. And everybody knows that if you're talking free roam in virtual reality today or even in August, um, you're talking backpack PCs and a high quality headset, it's expensive. And all the surroundings that you need to actually make the system run is expensive. So we started, coming back to Thomas, from the, from the goal side, how do we make money out of it? We make money if we have returning customers. To have returning customers, we need to make it affordable so that you go there like you go there in a cinema, a go-kart place, a bowling place, and so on. It needs to be in a good reachable area, not far outside the city. It needs to be in a city center, in a place where you can easily go by the train and ideally have uh, good parking spaces. And if we are talking franchise, ideally you should have an ROI on the system after two and a half years to make it easily financeable. We did some reverse engineering about, and this is again money side, not the creative side, because the creative side in our company, they want ideally 20 square meter per player, so they, they can build anything they want. This is never going to work uh, in real life financeable. So we're talking a minimum of 10 players. Uh, we designed the system for 12, so that we have a bit of buffer, because you will never have, never have, you probably never have full utilization of the system. Um, we said it should not be a lot over 400 square meters um, because of the rent that you have. And now comes the tricky part and um, the staff side. It should, not, should run with three people full time, not more, given the, the Swiss price of salaries that we have. Now, if you visited a, an arcade that is already existing worldwide, um, they look like this. This was one of the first ones in the US. Oh, they look a little bit fancier. This is IMAX. You see a lot of space. So this is one player playing here. You see the corridors. It's an experience area. IMAX also says, says it that way. But from a financial perspective, something like that in Switzerland will never work. And we know that IMAX is also at the moment paying on top based on the location um, that they are. If you are talking single player, and uh, you have three people there for, I think they have 12 pots, your employees will look like this. <laughs> because everyone that operates at the moment, these, these uh, system knows um, they have difficulties. And the, the player needs introduction, they need to know it doesn't work at the push of a button. I don't want to generalize this. If you are born in China, and if you know the Chinese market a little bit, they are well ahead of us, um, of course, you can operate the system very uh, easily. So, everything starts with game design. So basically, we designed the system and then said, okay, guys, you now need to fit your game 
respond to that space that we have, and we need to make it work with the players that need to be uh, on that space. If you take a 400 square meter facility, and you need a little bit of operations, you need a little bit of um, waiting space, you have 240 square meters left for players. This means that every player has about two and a half by two and a half meter of space if you count in security zones. Security zones means um, if the player is standing over there and you're both moving at the end of your play field and you both hold the gun, you don't want the other person to be touched by the gun and you don't want any accidents to happen. Then, ah, okay, I think there is a slide with Now, how, how do we do that? Two and a half meter by two and a half meters is not a lot of space. So we need to think in game design and also in movement of the people. If you have a game where people make fast reactions, turn around fast, um, maybe even run um, to dodge a bullet, you need to confine the space of the player to be safe. This next is an example of uh, the game we launched in uh, August together with our Kenzan Arena. It's a, a multiplayer shooter. The concept is a Roman Colosseum where you battle for survival. Each player is on a platform and they can teleport from platform to platform. That's how we limit the movement. Because if you look up, down, dodge bullets, you will crash into other people if you do it another way. Now, how do we fit more people in it and have actually um, people interacting? We need to design completely different games. This is another game that uh, we launched also in August, Enigmatic. It's an escape room game. So you have slow moving people, they see each other, they talk to each other, they react with each other. Three minutes left. And, and uh, have to solve a puzzle. This was the first one we demoed at the SVDR in San Jose. It's a very simple puzzle. You have to, with your scepters, direct something through a maze and you're slowly getting back from ghost to life. And when we launch, we will have around five scenarios where you, where you have to solve riddles in virtual reality. We focus on things you can't do in real life. That's actually how it looked like in San Jose. Two IKEA tables that you can bump into each other, have the right measurements and the scepters uh, in hand. Money is throughput, meaning you have to limit the number of minutes people play for the money they pay. 15 minutes is very intensive in virtual reality. It needs to be plug and play. So basically you can't put on every PC and get the people <coughs> set up. You need to push a button on the management console and the game starts when everybody is in position at the right time. You need to lead the people to their place. So you can't have somebody to talk to 12 people. You have to go there, you have to go there. The system needs to take uh, care of that so that uh, you get to the goal of throughput. We made the decision to buy versus build. Um, this year, backpack PCs that are on the market at a good price are actually working and they're working very well. We don't have problems with backpack pieces at the moment. We have more problems with, uh, with the displays, the full rate of the displays. Um, and these are developing really, really fast. So for August, we are ready with the current set, but already next year, we are expecting large improvements um, in these devices. Standardize. <coughs> mentioned that in the beginning. Standardize the facility, standardize the split place, standardize the APIs for third-party developers because we don't want to stay on the four games that we launch in, uh, in August. We want to have third-party developers coming in and also have their content uh, ready. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. If you want to test our kids, we have a little bit of time, so I can also have to talk to you and answer your questions. I made it in time. Yes, you did. Great. Thank you, Ronnie.